Okay, move aside if you don't want chalk dust on you. Um, the ones that are here are here. The ones that I gave back, I think, are elsewhere. I think that's all of them. Maybe not all of them, but many of them. Okay, go. Okay, um, is it time yet, or how many people say it's time? Time? Okay, okay, worry about those later, we'll get those after, they'll be here after class, make a quick move after the lecture's over. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's start off, first of all, are there any questions? Any questions about anything um, we're talking about in here? Okay. Um, again, the uh, midterms came back last time. If you didn't pick it up after class, pick up your midterm. Um, the gross distributions are posted. Any questions about that? What? The, the, there were few enough changes in response to the regrades that the distribution really won't change. Okay. It may have been you know, maybe by a tenth of a point or something like that. Any questions? Okay, the, um, the again, for now, what, what are we saying? You guys may start thinking a little bit about finals. Some people think, oh my God, I, I, I'm not happy with my grade. The final is, there's going to be a final in here, that's important. Um, it's a cumulative thing, which means that if you didn't understand the stuff for the second midterm on the second midterm, you're not going to understand it on the final unless you figure out a way to learn that stuff. There is typically going to be, if I remember, again, I'm doing it a little bit differently, it's cumulative. The stuff we're talking about NP completeness will be represented, but not overrepresented. So, you know, if you had trouble on the last midterm, it is important that you learn that material, because that, of course, is going to weigh more than the NP completeness stuff. Any questions? Yes? Should you concentrate more on the second midterm stuff? If you understood the first midterm stuff and you didn't understand the second midterm stuff, you should concentrate on the second midterm stuff. Am I going to make it basically uniform through the semester? That is the plan. You know, there's probably, you know, there's going to be some level of adjustment, but I'm not looking to weigh it more heavily one part of the semester. But, uh, but, but typically there's things people understood and people, things people didn't understand. And therefore, I encourage people to understand. How many questions will be on the final? Let's say I haven't thought that through because of the, um, you, this is the first time I've done the multiple choice thing. So in past years, I would have typically nine-ish real problems. You guys have had three on a midterm. And I didn't have a multiple choice. This year, I will presumably have a multiple choice again and presumably cut back the number of problems. But uh, more than that, I haven't completely figured out yet. Any questions? OK. Any questions about anything else logistical? OK. Any questions about NP completeness from what we were talking about last time? Or should I just kind of plunge into that? So we, again, we started looking at this notion of computational interactability. The daily problem um, is supposed to show you the power of decision problems. OK. It is asking us, they're saying, you know, we're saying the theory of NP completeness is built around decision problems, only yeses and noes. And you guys may be saying, well, that's not so impressive. I deal with problems like traveling salesmen where I give back a real answer, a tour, or I give back the optimal tour, or I give back the weight of the optimal tour. To prove that there's not really a big difference between that, this thing says, suppose I give you the traveling salesman decision problem which has the property of basically being the traveling salesman decision problem. Takes as input a graph and a K, and it says true or false is the tour less than or equal. Is, is there a tour in this graph of weight less than or equal to K? 
That's what it does. And I now ask you, can you use this as a subroutine to find the actual optimal tour? OK, do you see what the problem is? I give you a, a powerful thing that can solve this in, um, what you call it, linear time, let's say. Could you now find the optimal tour, the shortest tour that visits all the vertices? How would you do that using this as a black box? OK? Any ideas? Yes. Keep increasing the power of k. So right now, you're trying to say, what is the weight of the tour? There's two different problems here. One is, what is the weight of the tour? And the other is, what is the actual tour? And so what you are observing is that if we did some kind of binary, either sequential search, or to make it efficient, if I did a binary search, which arguably is, necess is arguably necessary to keep it polynomial, I would be doing a binary search on this. And um, what, why, why do I talk about binary search? Let's take a look at this thing. When we talk about exponential versus polynomial, and this seems kind of weird, you get the idea that you know, something that is order n is much slower than something that is order 2 to the n, let's say. This much, I mean, order n is much faster than something that's order 2 to the n, right? Now, what is the relationship between binary search, which is, excuse me, is log n, and linear search, which is order n? What is the relationship here? Yeah? Well, if you do a binary search on an exponential thing, you get an order n thing, right? Because log of 2 to the n is n times. Well, a way to look at this is that this is 2 to the this. Does everybody see that? What is this? Is n 2 to the log n? OK. So does everybody see kind of that there's a jump, the jump between polynomial and exponential is the same kind of jump as the jump between binary search and linear search? Does everybody kind of see that? This may be a revelation, but it's important to see here. This is why we were so excited about binary search when we discovered binary search. Right? Yeah? So is it easier to take the problem on the first midterm and just remove edges until OK, let's get, we'll get to that in a second. So I don't want to lose my, uh, my, my big train of thought here. OK, any questions? Do people see that there is the same kind of relationship between polynomial and exponential as there is between log n and n? And that's why to quibble about what you were saying, the idea of searching sequentially, is there a tour of size 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Notice that that is exponentially bigger than if I instead did a binary search. Does everybody kind of see that? So to find, what would I like to find? If I want to find how big the optimal tour is, the basic idea would be, if, if I knew an upper bound on the size of the possible tour, which might come from summing up all the edge weights in the graph. That's obviously an upper bound. OK? Or n times the weight of the biggest edge. That's obviously an upper bound, right? I could then do binary search and in log the size of the tour. OK? I would be able to log, log the weight of the tour. I would be able to find the tour, the size of the weight of the tour. Any questions about that? So does everybody agree that by binary search, I can find exactly what is the value of k, that there is a tour of weight k, but no tour of weight k minus 1, right? That's the optimum size, OK? Now, how do I find the tour using? And that would be something like log the sum of the weight of edges or something like that, OK? So times n, yeah. And you're saying, gee, this looks just like midterm 1, right? Does everyone remember that idea? If I have the property that I have a graph here, g, and there's an optimal a tour of size k, and I know that that's the optimum size tour, right? If I take an edge and I delete that edge, and the remaining graph has a, size, a tour of, of weight k, 
I don't need the edge I deleted, right? I can blow it away, and, ev and that's not necessary. If, on the other hand, I take the edge out, and suddenly the tor is of weight, the, the, the shortest tor that remains is of weight greater than k, then the claim is that that edge was a critical thing, right? And I'm going to put that edge back in the graph. And the claim is that by doing you know, n squared such edge deletion operations, I will eventually have tried removing every edge from the graph. Whatever I don't remove is the graph, right? Has anybody heard of how Michelangelo's instructions for how you carved the David, you know, the statue of David, the famous statue? said you take a piece of marble and you remove anything that is not the David. Okay? And that's exactly what we're doing here. Anything that's not in the traveling salesman tour, we would remove it. Okay? And what's left is going to be the tour. Any questions about that? So what this should sensitize you to is the idea that, in fact, these decision problems that I'm going to be restricting things to just for my convenience is not really a limitation. Okay? Does everybody see that this is not where any weasel words that I'm dealing with are, okay? D decision problems are, in general, powerful enough to do whatever kind of thing we're interested in doing. Yeah? Uh, is there any reason to work for more than DSP? The answer is uh, y yes. Uh, let's say the answer is yes, okay? Uh, that, 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 that usually if you have a, clever, a, a close enough decision problem to what you're trying to do, Usually, there's a clever way to use that to, to reconstruct things. I don't know if I can give you a formal argument on that, but, but I feel quite happy saying that I'm dealing with the right problems when I talk about decision problems. Okay? Any questions? Any questions about this kind of stuff? Okay, so let's go back and review what, again, is the main idea behind the theory of NP completeness. Okay? It is saying, suppose I give you an algorithm to solve the Bandersnatch problem. What is the Bandersnatch problem? Well, it's the name of a problem. The important things about the Bandersnatch problem are that it is a decision problem, so it returns yes or no on any input. And the argument to the Bandersnatch problem is something called G. What is it? Maybe it's a graph. Maybe it's a string. It, that's what the input instance is. Okay. And I give you the following algorithm that solves the Bandersnatch problem in the following way. It translates G, the input, the input instance to Bandersnatch, reformats it, translates it into an instance of the mobili uh, Y, which happens to be the input format desired for the mobility problem. And it has done that translation in a very, very clever way so that whenever Bandersnatch of G is true, Bobili of Y is true. And whenever Bandersnatch of G is false, Bobili of Y is false. If it's done the translation in a way that preserves the truth or falsity of the answer, then I can out, if I have a bo fast Bobili solver, I can call my Bobili solver on Y and return the answer of Bobili of Y as the ender of Bandersnatch of G. Any questions about how this algorithm works? OK. It has to do that translation in a way that the answers stay the same. OK. Any questions about that? Not just that both return true and false. That's pretty easy. But it needs to return the fact that when Bandersnatch of G is false, Bobili of Y is false. Any questions? OK. What is the implication of this algorithm? Okay. If Bobili of, has a, the, your Bobili solver is a slow algorithm, you have a Bobili solver, but it takes exponential time to run, solve it in the size of the Bobili instance. What, is the, the, what does this give you? Yeah? It gives you a slow Bandersnatch solver. You know, it's something, but it's not to get that excited about, right? But what if I have a guarantee written from the word of God that there is no way to have a sub-exponential algorithm, a fast algorithm for Bandersnatch of G? 
if there is no way to have a Bandersnatch algorithm that is fast, OK, and I give you this algorithm, what can I say about it? The translation, assuming you, you did the translation in a fast way, where it took polynomial time to do the translation, this step would take polynomial time. Returning the answer you got would take constant time, right? Just prints it out, right? True or false. The only thing in this thing that takes a lot of time is calling the Bobili solver. If there is no way to solve Bandersnatch quickly, and you have this algorithm, and that translation takes polynomial time, then there is no possible way Bobili can be solved quickly. Does everybody see that? Because if you could solve Bobili fast, this is a fast Bandersnatch solver. If there is no such thing as a fast Bandersnatch solver, what does this say? It says that Bobili is also can't be solved fast. So if Bandersnatch is a hard problem, and I can give you an algorithm like this to solve Bandersnatch using Bobili, what I have done is solve, um, what you call it? Uh, solve uh, the, um, you know, I've given you a proof that Bobili can't be solved fast. If Bandersnatch is hard, this algorithm means Bobili is also hard. Any questions? I'm using hard to mean does not exist a polynomial time algorithm, okay, or you know, a, a, a fast algorithm. Yes. So the only way that you could say, what if I have a fast Bobili solver? Is there any way that Bandersnatch could be slow? Recognize that there's this translation time. It is possible that you could describe an algorithm that does an extremely slow, well-thought-out answer to do the translation, OK? And then prints it out, OK? Suppose the translation was solve Bandersnatch, and then say, hey, here's the answer to Bandersnatch, OK? But if, if the translation is quick, and Bandersnatch can't be solved quick, then this means that Mobili can't be solved quick. That is the reasoning that we're going to be using. Any questions? And so the heart of coming up with proving that a problem is hard is coming up with this translation, coming up with this algorithm for it. Yes? Well, OK, first, let's, what do you have to do for, 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 for full credit, OK? This we haven't, let's say, gotten deeply enough yet for you to, to deal with that. But it is pretty clear the minimum that I'm going to be asking you to do is specify what is Bandersnatch and what is Bobili, OK? And then I'm going to be asking you to describe how you construct y from g, right? I haven't shown you an example of how I've done this translation, so this can still be a mystery to you at this moment. But eventually you'll see that the amazing thing about this stuff is that once you are good at it and you see it all, these translations are often amazingly simple to translate uh, a hard problem that we know is hard, like let's say satisfiability, into a problem that we care about, OK? And again, you have to see enough to believe me. That right now, you shouldn't believe me yet. Any questions about that? OK, the, um, when we do a translation, we call this kind of a reduction. I don't know if I mentioned this. Uh, did, I, did I have my slide on this? Probably. Boop, boop, boop. No, I think I didn't do this last time. There was this notion of, uh, you know, boom. Wait, where am I going here? Bang, OK? So um, what we call a reduction is a translation of a problem to another problem that would solve it, OK? That's kind of what I would say is a reduction, OK? And if you think of this algorithm, we are basically reducing Bandersnatch to Bobili. Does everybody see it? If we can solve Bobili fast, we can solve Bandersnatch fast, OK? There is a story about reductions that I like. This thing about, you know, you have this engineer and this computer scientist are sitting around trying to make tea. Okay, they're sitting around the cabin, they're talking to each other. The engineer gets up, reaches for says, I want some tea, gets a tea kettle off the shelf, fills it with water, boil, puts it on the stove, turns on the stove, waits for it to get hot, 
Okay, puts the tea bag in the in the glass, pours the water into the tea, in, into the into the cup, puts down the uh, the water back on the stove, the remaining hot water, and says, "I have made tea." The engine, computer scientist looks at this with interest. Okay, then says, "I want some tea." So what does the computer scientist do? They pick up the kettle of hot water, pour the water out, put the um, tea kettle back on the shelf, and then say, I'm done. Why? I've now reduced it to a solved problem. Does everybody see that? There's a problem you know how to solve. Once you've seen the engineer, so you know how to solve it, right? And you take your problem and you're reducing it to that. Okay, that's kind of the thinking that we're trying to do here. Any questions about that? Okay. We're trying to reduce the complexity of our thinking by reducing it to a problem that we know how to solve. In this case, the reduction is kind of to mobility. Any question? Okay, good. And um, let's go back to uh, what is the mother of all hard problems. The problem that we are going to be using as the mother of all hard problems was satisfiability, which I discussed at the end of class last time. Um, just to review quickly, a satisfiability is a logic problem that says basically your input is a logic formula of a specific type over a set of Boolean variables, v1, v2, vn, okay, dot, 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 up to vn. The logic formula is of the form, you've got a bunch of clauses, okay, a clause is a subset of variables, some of which may be negated, okay, and we are saying our clause is the or of this and this, and the next clause, kachunk, which is the or of this or this. So you are representing a, a logical formula as, again, the important thing is to, 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 the important thing that you need to be able to understand now is the transformation from me listing clauses to what the logic formula is. Okay? If I give you a bunch of logical formulas, a bunch of logic clauses, let's say I give you v1, not v3, v5, comma, let's say v1, v2, v7, v not v9, and let's say v9. Okay, how do we read this? This is V1 or not V3. Does everybody see the complement means not? Or V5. Parenthesis around it. And V2 or V2, V1 or V2 or V7 or not V9. And V9. Does everybody see what the logic formula here is? Any questions about that? So it's a special type of logic formula where it is the, I think we call it the conjunction. I think we, and I think means conjunction, right, in fancy terms, right? And or means disjunction, right? It is the conjunction of a bunch of disjunctive statements, if that helps you. If not, these are ors. So, and the question really is, given this logic formula, is there a way to make it true? Does everybody see that? You have the choice of setting the formulas to be, um, each variable to be either true or false. You want to make this formula true, okay? And the question for a satisfiability, is there a way to make it true? Okay, question. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. What is the input size for this example? Okay. So the way that I would think about these things, I would usually count the input size. There's some delicate questions of input size I'm sweeping under the rug. Okay. But basically, let's say that in general, I would say the input size is something like n, which is the number of variables, you know, and m is the number of clauses. Okay, 
It should be clear that since each clause has at most one variable, each variable at most once, to be interesting. If I have n clauses and m variables, you could write this thing down in something like n times m space for input. You agree? OK? So I'm going to talk in terms of how many clauses and how many variables there are. And it's clear that to represent one of these problems, the input takes something like that's n times m at most to represent a, a formula. Any questions about that? So any question about what satisfiability means? Certain problems, there are ways to set the variables true and false, okay, such that it's satisfiable. I showed this example last time. If I set for this formula here, both of them true. V1, true or not true, is true. And not true, false or true. False or true is true. True and true is true. That's a proof that this formula can be satisfied, right? Other formulas cannot be satisfied. This was the example that I gave. Here I've got three of these things. And to satisfy the last clause, f1 had better be false, or else there's no hope for getting the last clause done, right? Once I've got v1 false, v2 had better be false, or there's no way to get the second clause right. Right? Satisfied, right? And once they're both false, I'm, 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 I, I, I'm out of luck because that, that messes up the first clause, right? There's no way to set the variables for this one so that it's satisfied. The other one there was. And it's clear that there is an exponential algorithm, one that runs in 2 to the n time, that tries all possible assignments of true and false. You have n variables. There's two to the n ways you can make them true or false, right? And therefore, there is an exponential time algorithm to test whether a formula is satisfiable. OK? I will claim that there is no substantially better algorithm for than that, because satisfiability is the mother of all hard problems. OK? Why do I, any question about what satisfiable is, satisfiability is? because we're going to now use it as a tool. But any question about what the problem is? OK? Now, why do I say satisfiability is the mother of all hard problems? OK? There are a couple of different explanations. Some, some you should be, one that you should be able to believe that in my mind is good enough, OK, is given that every professor who's ever taught an algorithms class says, Satisfiability is a hard problem. Nobody knows how to do it. An ambitious student who knew how to do it, or a professor who wanted to get tenure and said, said if I could figure out a way to do it, I bet they will like me. OK? So every algorithms person in the world has thought, knows that if you could come up with a satisfiability algorithm, you would be a famous person. You would be a rich person. There's a million dollar prize on the head if you could come up with a fast algorithm for this. That would, give you, yeah, that would be good enough to prove that, that, that p is not equal to np, and that's worth a million dollars. So the social reason alone is a good enough reason, in my mind, to believe that satisfiability is hard. Everyone in the world has, knows that this is the problem, that if you could solve in polynomial time, you would have done something wonderful. OK? People have thought about it. Nobody's done it. This is a proof that nobody, if your problem is as hard as satisfiability, there's nobody else who knows how to solve it. That should be believable. Any questions about that? OK? There's also a lot of other technical reasons why satisfiability is known to be hard. It turns out that there's a, there's a stronger guarantee on it that if you could, you could solve satisfiability quickly, you could solve any problem you could solve with what they call a non-deterministic Turing machine. Anything that can be solved with a non-deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time, you could solve in polynomial time without non-determinism, which if you took a, a 303, they may have talked about non-determinism. It's some guessing power. This would be an amazing thing. If you proved polynomial, basically what would be true is the following. If you proved satisfiability, had a fast algorithm, Everything that is essentially of, in, in a big class of problems called NP, 
meaning all the problems that we've ever talked about in here, or would ever be likely to talk about in here, all of them have fast algorithms, if you can find a fast algorithm for, pol for satisfiability. So there's all kinds of different reasons and there's why it, is a, it would be people don't believe this. It's not just that nobody's found one. And it's not just that everybody uses it as a target. It's that if, if you come up with a fast algorithm for this, the edifice of all kinds of complex things that people believe crumbles. Okay? You find a fast algorithm for satisfiability, suddenly there's nothing secure on the internet anymore. Because RSA will break. Okay? And two days later, every, everything will be hacked all over the world. Okay? So, so there's good reasons to believe why satisfiability is hard. Any questions? Okay. And yes? You know, the question of what quantum computers do. The truth is that if, even if you build quantum computers, which is this piece of magic that people think they will solve certain problems, it turns out that quantum computers will not be able to solve polynomial uh, NP-complete problems either. Okay? So quantum computers aren't enough to, to, to make me nervous about solving satisfiability. Turns out they're enough to, for you to break at RSA. So it makes you nervous about the internet, but I don't care about the internet. <laughs> I'm worried about the edifice of computer science. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Let's go through the more technical stuff. But any questions about the implications of this or anything? Okay. So now, this whole Bandersnatch Bobili idea is about translating problems, proving problems hard by translation. Isn't that right? So let's now take, we know that satisfiability is hard because I tell you so and because of all these other magical things. Um, let's look at a, a, what sounds like it might be an easier problem. Three satisfiability is satisfiability where every clause contains exactly three literals in it. Okay? If you looked at this one, I guess this Ha clause has three literals in it. This clause, bunk, 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 does not have one, three. This has four. This one has one in it. Does everybody see it? In its full-blown glory, satisfiability clauses can have up to n variables. They don't have to have n variables in it. If I restrict satisfiability to having clauses of length three, maybe it's an easier problem. In fact, let's take a look at this. If I give you a satisfiability problem where every clause has length 1, can you guys give me a fast algorithm to decide whether or not it's satisfiable? So I give you a, a, something that says v to 3, not, or, you know, and, not v2, and v7. You see what I mean? Now every clause here has one literal in it. Can anyone give me an algorithm to decide whether a clause, a, an expression like this has a way of satisfying it? Yes? Saying a linear number of AND operations, I have to come up with for each variable what is the assignment to it. How would I find out, what would you give how would you tell me what the true or f what values to set each variable to to satisfy it if it can be done? Okay. Uh, yes. So v3 is going to be true. V2 is going to be false. V7 is going to be true. Okay, Almost, sort of like that, except that, that doesn't really capture why might it not be satisfiable. Okay, yeah? If I have somewhere in here not V7, then I'm in trouble. Does everybody see that? So the test of whether or not a formula like this would be satisfiable is simply does a literal and its negation both appear. If bo a literal and its negation both appear, there's nothing you can do if on a one sat problem like that. Does everybody see? Any questions about that? 
Or equivalently, you know, it's, it's if I ever had a contradiction. You're saying, okay, I set V2 to be true, that's good. Now I want to set it to be false, but wait, I already said it to be true. That would be the, tr the contradiction. So does everybody see that if I have a, pro a simple enough satisfiability problem where every clause had one literal in it, it would be easy to tell if you could satisfy it, right? How many people see this? On this level, you should be seeing things. Any questions? Okay. And sure, if I have full big law clauses, it's hard. But what if the clauses are of length three? Yes. I have a question. What is length three or four or plus? It's length four. So whenever any of them is just true, this plus just will be true. No matter what. No, in an or. What is the problem with an or? If I have v3 or v4, that's an or, right? To make it true, I c notice why it's now harder. If v2 or v3 or v3 is 4 is true, can I set v3 to be true? Well, not surely, right? I was confident here v3 had to, had to, had to be true, or else I had no chance, right? Here, do I set V3 to be true? Do I don't care? Well, yes, I do care. What if I do set this to be true? And I set this one, and now I have a someplace else out there, not V3. Well, but now what if I have a complex combination of things? Where there are all these, you have a bunch of clauses with some things being positive and, and some things being negated, and it's very complicated. They interact. Does everybody see I can't do what I did here, which was definitively state, set a variable, and know I'm right? If I've got longer clauses, now there is some level of ambiguity. You know, I, I, now, now there's many possibilities, right? And once I set one of these variables, maybe I'll say, well, do it. Well, maybe I'll try to set V3 to be true and see what happens. And I go through and do some logic. But if I hit a dead end, then that was a mistake. And it looks like I'm backtracking or something like that, right? Any questions about that? So it should be clear for clauses of length 1, the problem is easy. For clauses of length n, up to n, I say, it's hard, and you should trust me. What about clauses of length 3? How would I prove that satisfiability restricted to clauses of length 3, or 3 set, is a hard problem? How would I prove that? Yeah? I didn't show that 2 is hard. I, I, I made a hand wave something. I didn't show anything about 2. OK, yes. You know, what you're saying here is that if I could show that three satisfiability was hard, then it would be obvious that real satisfiability is hard. Well, I'm saying if you find one example of three satisfiability that takes exponential time, then it's an upper bound. That it's that, that's, so sort of what you're saying is, let's think what, we, what we're trying to do. We're trying to reason that three sat is hard. One way to do it is, notice that if a special case is difficult, the more general problem is difficult, right? OK? If, you know, if, you know, if, um, you know, Skeena's midterm is hard, and his final exam includes a midterm, my, what do we know about my final exam? It's going to be hard, right? That's the special case going to the general case. Here we're trying to do the opposite if you look at it. The general case was satisfiability. We said just because the satisfiability, the, the big thing is hard, does it mean that a special part of it is hard? If Skeena's exam is hard, was it hard to bubble in your name at the beginning part of the, uh, uh, write your name in on the top part of the exam? Not necessarily, right? Okay, but let's now get to the uh, question. Okay, you say if I showed one instance of three set was hard, would that do it? Recognize that any one instance, there's a little, I'm going to give some weasel words here. If I said that I only had one problem, look, this one problem is hard. That one problem ultimately has an answer, true or false, right? Yes. 
For one problem, someone might whisper in your ear, oh, it's, it's, it's true, okay? So, so we're really talking about a class of problems. And let's maybe back away from that, because I don't like where this is leading me, okay? Yes? Okay, you're saying do a reduction. This is the kind of thinking that I'm trying to do. Let's go back to Bandersnatch and mobility, because this is the only thing that I really care about in here. If I want to prove that 3 sat is hard, I need a Bandersnatch and a mobility. What is Bandersnatch and what is mobility? Yeah? Right, so what we're saying here is you're trying to give an algorithm, you're saying, if I could give an algorithm such that, okay, then this, that, that to solve satisfiability on a set of clauses, okay, what's mobility going to be? Three set on a set of, let's call them C prime. Uh, let's call them C prime. Suppose I could take my input to satisfiability, translate C, C to C prime, call 3 set on this new instance. If this formula was satisfiable, if and only if this formula was satisfiable, then I could return the answer of 3 set of C prime as the answer of sat of C. Okay? Yes? So if we take the three variables in an or and define them to a new variable, that means that we can make the three... Okay, you're trying to tell me how to do a translation. Yeah. I don't, I'll tell you how to do a translation. You don't tell me how to do a translation. Okay, at least at first. Any questions? But do people see the implication of it? That's the thing that I really want to make sure you see what the strategy is of how I'm doing these things. Bandersnatch is satisfiability. Bobili is three set. If I can show you how to translate any satisfiability instance into a three set instance, such that the three set instance is satisfiable if and only if the big set instance is satisfiable, then I have done my job. Okay? Any questions? And now I need to show the translation. Yes. Does it matter if, if, if I map this to this or this to this? The answer is yes, because if I put 3sat over here, let's say I did it the other way. What you're saying is, what if I had done 3sat and I showed you a way to solve 3sat by calling satisfiability? What would I have? There must be a slow way of doing it. This is a, a slow way of solving 3sat. Does everybody believe it? I know I can solve satisfiability in 2 to the n. You do the translation from 3 set to satisfiability, congratulations, you have a slow way of solving 3 set, right? On the other hand, if I can translate sat into 3 set, then I have a proof that 3 set is hard. Okay? Any questions about the strategy here? Okay? Now, we have to see how we do the translation, right? Now I'm willing to listen to your translation idea for a second. So if we sort of cluster the variables in sat so that we have each one of them mapped to one of the three variables in a three set, and then if we can find the three set, then we can you know, expand back up and try to... Okay, what you're trying to say is you want to do something that's going to take... Each clause is going to be a list of variables, yeah. right? And what you want to do is to somehow translate this into a clause of three. Well, one way to translate it to a clause, a clause of three is to delete some variables, but what's the problem with that? It doesn't mean the same thing, right? Okay. Would you settle for translating this into many clauses of three that has the same logical impact as that? Okay. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to show you now how to do this translation so that we can preserve the truth of it. Okay, let's take a look at that. Boom, boom, boom. Three set. How am I going to do this translation? Suppose I give you a, cl a clause that, I would take each clause 
and systematically translate it into some other clauses, each clause of which is going to be of length 3. And maybe I'm going to introduce some new logic variables to make it easier for me. OK? So my new 3SAT problem is going to have all the logic variables, the, the, the same set of logical variables as the original, plus some more I'm going to use as intermediate variables in my translation. What if my clause only contains one variable, z1? How can I create three set clauses that will have the same effect? What if I add two new variables, v1 and v2, and create four clauses of the form, each of which have z1 in it, and which have all other poss four possibilities of true or negated versions of the literals. V1, V2, V1, not V2, not V1, V2, not V1, not V2. What is interesting about this, OK? Do you, you see how mechanically you can write a program that, given this, could print this out? OK, doing the translation here shouldn't seem like a miracle you can write an algorithm to do that translation, right? But what's interesting about these clauses? I claim that if z1 is true, then all four of these things can be satisfied, so the end of them is going to be true. And if z1 is not true, it's false, then there is no way to make all four, the end of these four things true. Why? If z1 is true, does this thing have a true literal in it, regardless of what v1 and v2 are? Yes or no? Yes. If z1 is true, is this thing going to be true? The whole clause going to be true? Yes. It's the or, right? So true or whatever, true or whatever, true or whatever, true or whatever. If z1 is true, the end of these things, they're all satisfiable. Any way you said v1 or v2. Yes? Well, OK, so first of all, recognize that what I'm trying to do here is a translation. I'm not trying to find out whether z1 is z or z2 is true. This is an important point. I am not trying to find out whether z1 or z2 is true. All I am trying to do is to reformat the input. So if you knew how to satisfy tell whether a clause, set of clauses was satisfiable, it would tell you whether my original clauses were satisfiable, right? Now, suppose z1 was, happened to be false, meaning that in a given truth assignment, this thing wasn't going to be able to be satisfied. Is there a way that I could, if this was false, is there a way this or thing could be true? Yes by setting either v1 or v2 false, right? Is there a way that I could get both of these things satisfied? Well, if v1 was false, yes, and v2 was, you know, it didn't really matter, right? But is it clear that no matter how you set v1 or v2, one of these four, the v's are not going to have a true pair in it, right? If v1 and v2 are both true, this one loses. If they're both false, this one loses. If v1 is true and v2 is false, this one loses. OK? So the important thing here is that if there is a solution to the original problem, which is satisfiable, if I replace this one clause with these four clauses, the problem is still satisfiable, right? And if it wasn't satisfiable before, it's still going to not be satisfiable. Any questions about that? OK, yeah? What? OK, you're telling me another way that I, you're saying, what if? You're, you don't, in, in my version of satisfiability, I said every clause was a variable, right? A variable or a negation of a variable. 
You want to define a slightly more macho version of satisfiability, where I'm also allowed to set certain things to be false. Okay, explicitly, right? If I could, so, so you want me to say, why don't I just instead write a clause like this? Okay? False. False. Z1. That's what you're really asking, right? Why not? Well, in my specification of my input, I said I needed three variables in each clause, right? Is this a variable or a constant? Is a false a, a variable or a constant? Well, you're, you're, okay. If the input says, give me, it has to have three variables. Okay? You're saying, no, let the input be variables or a constant, right? In your version, I agree, this would work, right? If I'm insisting that all three things be variables, what do I get if I make that a constant? I get a type error or a formatting error. Does everybody, you see what I mean? Okay? So if I'm, if I'm insisting that every clause contain exactly three variables in it, these are four clauses with exactly three variables that has the same effect as your original clause. Any question? Yes? What I'm doing, I'm not showing it hard to solve. This is what is showing it's hard to solve. What I am showing now is how do I do my translation, right? This thing has clauses of length one, two, three, dot, 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 up to n. For this, I need my clauses to be length three, right? I've got to find a way to translate this input so that I get a new set of clauses every one of which is of length 3, with the property that this thing is going to be satisfiable if and only if that thing is satisfiable. So I have to show you how to do the translation, right? This is a chunk of the translation. If the, thing is, the clause had one variable, this is a way to make clauses of three variables with the same effect. Any questions? Is my translation done? What's still missing? Someone with a louder voice. What's missing? Yes? K greater than 1. There can be clauses of length 2, right? I've got to show you how to translate that. How can I translate a clause of length 2? Suppose it is Z1, Z2 is my clause. Is there a way that I can make clauses of length 3 that will be true if and only if those other two variables are satisfied. I claim if I create a new variable v1, unused virgin variable, not going to be in anything else, okay? And I set it to be, now have the clauses v1, z1, z2, and not v1, z1, z2. I have two clauses. Is there any way that if z1 Either Z1 or Z2 is true. Are both these clauses going to be true? Yes. If Z1 and Z2 are both false, is there any way to make both of these clauses true? I want to hear more aggressively. If Z1 and Z2 are false, is there any way to make both these clauses true? No, because I said, ah, I said V1 to be true. But then I, it doesn't, my magic goes away for the second clause. Does everybody see that? So now I have a way to translate a clause of length 2 into two clauses of length 3, which have the same logical power. Any questions? What do I do with a clause of length 3? Just copy it. Okay, that's good. Okay. The harder case is, what if I have a long clause? What if I have a clause, um, let's say a clause, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. Does anyone want me to make it longer? Eh, Z5, fine. What if I can break this thing into clauses of length 3? How am I going to do it? What if I say Z1, Z2, and V1? Okay. What?
You want me to create five, choose three? OK, so you say try all subsets of three variables, right? This makes me a little nervous, because <laughs> it is growing the number of clauses a lot, right? Although choose n choose 3 is only going to be n cubed, so that wouldn't be enough to make me nervous. But that's not going to, it wouldn't work that way. Why? Because if I try all subsets of size 3, let's say I take a look, let them, let's, let, let's say I did all subsets of size 3. If, if, if this thing is true, this clause is true, is z1, z2, z3, and z3, z4, z5, are they both true? Doesn't have to is the important point. What if this was true, false, 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 false? Does everybody see that? Now what's going to happen here? True, false, false, this one is true. False, 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 uh, not true. Does everybody see that? So if I broke this thing up into all subsets of three things, it's not logically equivalent. Does everybody, you see what I mean? Any questions about that? It is a translation. But it didn't preserve correctness, right? Any questions? What's a better translation? Let me show you my translation. My translation is z1, z2, add a new variable, negate that variable, put in z3, and excuse me, Create another variable, v2. And then, not v2, z4, z5. Do you see what I did now? I created a chain of clauses here, three cl clauses in a chain. What is interesting about this? OK? If I get this expression, is there a way to make these variables, just the, all of them, true? True, 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 false. What can I do with v1? Well, I could set it as true or false. It doesn't care for this guy, right? But it's going to care for, let, let's look over here. Let's maybe look at the other side. This is false and false. Does everybody see that? What do we know about z2? It had better be false, right? Or else I can't save this clause, right? So I'm going to make z2 false, which makes, no, not, uh, make, 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 make this thing, z2, z2 is going to be equal to false, which is going to make not z2, uh, yeah, 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 not v2 is going to be true, right? Therefore, this is now going to be, False, this thing is going to be false. No, no, no. Notice that if not v2 is false, if v2 is false, not v2 is true. That's what I needed to save the clause, right? Here, because this is the same variable, this thing is going to be false. It doesn't save this clause, right? This one doesn't save that clause. But who can come to the rescue? This guy can come to the rescue, right? And now it's going to be saying v2. v1 is going to be false. And that's going to unfortunately make, that'll take care of this. But this guy's now going to be false, right? And the only way that I can save it now is if one of these two happens to be true. Does everybody see that? So the cool thing about this chain of clauses is it will have the same logical power as that one big clause. OK? Any questions about how many people see this now? How many people don't see it and want to? Any questions? OK, any questions? Yes? Well, what am I doing here? 
Um, okay, yes. Yeah. So this is, this is probably a problem. Yes, yeah, so this, right. So th do, do what I did there, not what I did there. Okay? And send me mail so I fix it. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Do you see how I'm getting a chain here, a logical chain? And again, if I did it that way, I've got a tautology, right? And it's, uh, that's obviously wrong. Okay? Any questions about this? So the important thing here is, if you look at what I've done, I have given you a way to take these set of clauses in a dumb mechanical way, translate them to clauses of length three, such that the shebang here is satisfiable, if and only if the shebang there was satisfiable. Okay? So if you have a fast reset solver, you can turn it loose on this thing, and you'll get an answer, and that would solve satisfiability fast. But there's no way to solve satisfiability fast. So I guess that means that there is no way to solve, this proves that there's no way to solve three sat fast. Any questions about that? So this is what, how we prove that three sat is as hard as satisfiability. Any questions? One sat is easy. Three sat is hard. Yes? Why did we skip two sat? Because it turns out that two set is easy, okay? But it's not easy to show it's easy, okay? So, but why does this thing break down for two set? Why can't I use the same idea for two set? Because it's like I've got a link to me and a link from me, right? If I'm only allowed to carry two, I can't stick any content in there. Does everybody see that? Is four set going to be hard? Yes. Why? I can just carry two pieces of baggage in here instead of one. Does everybody see that? So four set is hard, five set is hard. It turns out that two set is going to be easy. Okay? Any questions about it? But, it, but it's, it's, it, that requires some, 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 some complexity. Yes? So what you're saying here is that um, we need, in order to do this Bandersnatch Bo Billy thing, we need a Bandersnatch. Let's go back here again. I always have to go back to this again. We, we're going to be doing a Bandersnatch thing. Bandersnatch was satisfiability here. Could we use any other hard problem as, satis as Bandersnatch? The answer is yes. Okay, if I, what, now I have proven to you that 3SAT is as hard as satisfiability, right? If you could solve 3SAT, you could solve satisfiability. Therefore, 3SAT is even harder than, sat, or at least as hard as satisfiability, right? So could you use 3SAT now as Bandersnatch? Yes. Is 3SAT a better, sat a better Bandersnatch? Well, let's think about it. In, in some ways, it's a better Bandersnatch. Why is it? Because note that what I've got to do is to translate all instances of my Bandersnatch into something else. The original SAT had clauses of size 1 and 2 and 3 and N and all Mishigas, right? Now in 3SAT, all the clauses are of size 3, right? Is it going to be easier to write a translation for some other problem if I know all the clauses are of size 3? Maybe. Certainly shouldn't be harder, right? So in fact, by having a simpler looking hard problem, that's probably a better Bandersnatch, right? That's why we talked about 3SAT in the real instance. Why I care about 3SAT is it is actually a simpler Bandersnatch to work with. Okay, and I can use any, banders any hard problem here as a bandersnatch. Any questions about that? Okay, let me, any questions about this right now? Okay. Now let me show you a much more interesting problem. Say, well, I don't care about sad, I don't care about logic, I don't care about three sad. Vertex cover, at one point in the semester, you cared about. Is that correct? Did you guys have homework problems on vertex cover? What was vertex cover? 
Vertex cover is a, 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 a kind of problem that, that, that's the kind of problem I kind of like to think about. I have a graph. And if it's a decision problem, I have a k. I am going to ask, is there a subset of k vertices or, uh, such that every edge kisses, OK, or it ha touches, every edge is incident upon at least one vertex in the cover? Which is the cover here? The uh, white, the, 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 um, the, let's say the circle nodes. Are the circle nodes here a cover? According to this, the circle nodes are a cover because every edge touches at least one of the vertex, the, the circle nodes. Does everybody agree? Are the, um, what do you call it, the, the uh, non-circle nodes, do they form a cover? No, why not? Because this edge here does not touch. Neither of its endpoints are one of those, right? So these four vertices form a vertex cover. Does everybody see that? Any questions about that? OK. Any questions about it? Can someone give me a, an algorithm, given a graph, find a vertex cover of that graph? Can someone give me an efficient algorithm, given a graph, find a vertex cover of the graph? Yes? Take all the vertices. Take all the vertices. Does everybody see that if I take all the vertices in the graph, I have a cover of it? Does every vertex touch one of the, at least one of those vertices? So congratulations. You take all the vertices, you've got a vertex cover. What is, makes an interesting vertex cover? A small subset of vertices. Does everybody get that idea? So the minimum vertex cover problem, or as we'll call it the decision problem here, I ask you for a given k, is there a subset of less than k, vert k vertices or less that cover all the edges in the graph? Any questions about that? Here for four, the circle things prove four suffice. Is there a way to do it for three? Yeah? You say, if I got rid of the top left one, would I have a cover of size three? No, because this edge is uncovered, right? I claim there's no better way to do it. I think I need to have, what you call it? I need to have either this or this. I need to have either this or both of them to cover those outternal edges. And then, um, if that's true, I still have edges uncovered. There's no way that I can do it with three. OK, four is the minimum cover, right? So for this graph, is there a cover of size four? Yes, to circle vertices. Is there a cover of size five? Yes, to circle vertices and whatever else you want to take. Is there a cover of size three? No. Any questions? OK. How can we? My claim is it's hard to do this. How would we prove that vertex cover is hard? If I wanted to prove that it's hard to find the vertex cover, how do I do it? Yes. I need to reduce it to something. I need to bandersnatch and mobili it, right? What is bandersnatch going to be and what is mobili going to be? What do you recommend? What is mobili? What is my mobility problem if I want to prove vertex cover is hard? Vertex cover. And what's the arguments to vertex cover? A graph and a bound k. Does everybody agree? What should bandersnatch be? You say traveling salesman. I haven't shown you traveling salesman is hard. How can you use traveling salesman? OK, what problems do you know are hard? Satisfiability and three satisfiability. Which one do I like better? I tell you I like three sets, so now you like three set, right? <laughs> Does everybody see that the strategy I want to use is to take a three set problem, those set of clauses, translate them into a graph and an integer such that the, this thing graph is going to have a cover of this size if these clauses were satisfiable. 
That's what I want to do. You may say, my God, how do I do that translation? But do you see that that's what I want to do? Any questions? Let me show you the translation, OK? So I, am going to const I have to construct, take a logical formula and translate it into a graph. What is a graph made out of? Vertices and edges, right? So let me show you how I'm going to do my translation. I'm going to do my translation in a couple of parts. My satisfiability formula had a set of Boolean clauses on Boolean variables, right? If there's n variables in my problem, I am going to construct the following thing on 2 times n vertices. I'm going to create, for every one of my Boolean variables, I'm going to create two vertices in the graph, which is for naming them. One I'm going to name v1, one I'm going to name not v1. One I'm going to name v2, one I'm going to name not v2. Dot, 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 vn, not vn. OK? Does everybody see what my graph looks like so far? What is the size of a vertex cover on this graph? The smallest possible vertex cover on this graph so far? N. I can pick either this vertex or this vertex, but I'd better pick one of them, right? I can pick one of these or one of those. Does everybody agree so far? I, I, the minimum vertex cover of this graph is N, and it doesn't sound like much of a challenge to find one, right? OK. I am also going to translate each clause into a triangle of vertices, OK? So what is this thing going to do? If it was three sat, every clause had how many literals in it? Three. I am going to create a triangle for every single clause. OK? What was the logical name? What was this, this clause? V1, not V4, not V3. Does everybody see that? What was this clause? Not V1. Not V4, V2. OK? Does everybody see how if you give me three, a clause of three, I can create three new vertices and connect them in just a triangle? OK? If I give you this triangle here, what is the vertex cover, the minimum vertex cover size of this triangle? How many vertices do I need to take? Does every, and which two do I have to take? Any two. Does everybody see that if I take this one and this one, this edge is covered twice, but I get the other two for free, right? I get the other two, right? Is there any way I could cover all three with one triangle per edge? No. OK? So if I give you a graph, these are all the vertices in my graph. Forget the connecting edges for just a second. If I take my sat, three sat instance, where I had n variables and m clauses, I am going to have n of these widgets, call them gadgets. I am going to have m of these triangles. What is the vertex cover size of this graph going to be? n plus? 2 times m. Does everybody see that? So the minimum vertex cover of this graph is going to be n plus 2m. Does everybody see that? If I add another edge to the graph, is the vertex cover going to go up or, up or down? If I add another edge to a graph, what's going to happen to the vertex cover size? Yeah? It'll possibly go up. It won't go down, right? It's not going to suddenly make it easier to add more work to be done, right? But it's possible that I may not actually need to, need to add another vertex to it, right? Suppose I add this edge to it. Did my vertex cover size go up? No. How would I do that? I had to pick either one or this one or this one, right? What if I pick this one, right? 
Now that edge is killed, right? That I didn't didn't cost me any more, right? Okay. Now let me finish my construction. The very logical things had names v1 not v1, v2 not v2, v3 not v3, right? The clauses had names in it. What if I add an edge between v1 and any clause vertex labeled v1? I add an edge between any v, not v1 and any clause vertex labeled not v1. OK? Do people see what my construction here is? You see how you could write a program to do this construction, this translation? Given a three-set formula to construct a graph like this? What is, any questions about that? Yes? What? This is, yes, you, the negation thing you can't see very well. That's negated, 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 negated. Right? That's why not, not v4 is there. OK? What's interesting about this? Now think about this for one second more. OK? What's interesting about it? I claim it, that the size of the vertex cover will remain n plus 2c if and only if the original logic formula was satisfiable. Why is that? Was this logical formula satisfiable? Is there a way to satisfy these two clauses? Yeah. What would be the variables? Let's take a look at that. Hopefully it's clean underneath, but probably not. Boom. Stop. Go up. What is a, 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 a truth assignment that you can give me for these logical variables to make it satisfiable? Yeah? True, true, false, false. Is that satisfiable? Yes, because V1 now has, this one has V1 taken care of, right? This one has not V4 taken care of. Does everybody see that? So suppose, because it's satisfiable, I claim that at least one of those edges to the, that is kissing the triangle is taken care of. It's already covered by that truth assignment, right? Now, if one of these edges is covered, can you give me a cover of the triangle and the other two edges? that will only take two vertices. Which other, which vertices of the, how should I cover the triangle with two vertices that picks up the other incident edges? Yeah? You're saying, yeah, take this one and this one. Does everybody see that? And what about this one? If this one's taken care of, if I take this and this, does that, you see that now all of these extra connecting edges were taken care of for free? How many people see this? Okay. Okay. This thing that is interesting about this translation, the amazing thing is, if you give me a truth assignment, okay, for this, then I can give you a cover of this of size n plus 2c. Does everybody see that? And what if there is no possible truth assignment? OK? Is there any way you can cover this thing in n plus 2c vertices? You're going to be saying, well, I've got to cover, somehow I've got to pick one out of these two, right? Let's say it's not a satisfying truth assignment. What would not be a satisfying truth assignment? Let's say this one, this one. This one, this one. Does everybody see that that's not a satisfying proof assignment? Is there any way that it is possible to turn this thing into a cover using two vertices per triangle? You go here and say, yeah, look, I've got an edge on this. If I pick this and this, all of those edges are covered. This is covered. 
This is covered, and this one's covered, and I covered all three. But what's going to happen here? I, I'm not covering this edge. I'd better grab this. I'm not going to cover this vertex. I'd better grab that. But now I don't have room to cover that last edge.